Welcome to Tales from the Hellmouth, a Buffy and Angel podcast. I'm your host, Adam, and with me is my co-host, Thomas. Thomas, how's it going? I'm very good. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's uh, exciting to finally be record. Well, we're recording it and people are listening to it. That is this first episode. We've been the genesis of this project was basically I think I contacted you about it in probably May or June. Yeah, something like that. It's been a couple of months. And we've been going back and forth and and, and throwing about ideas and then we teased it on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, we put up the graphic it, and all and that. Then let it go for about a month, and people were like, "What the hell happened?" Or maybe they weren't. I, I don't know. But that's what. It is. And uh, we just decided that, hey, what what better time to start a Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, and Angel podcast than right around Halloween time? Yeah. Uh, it made perfect sense. That's why we made the change. And uh, and here we are, our our very first inaugural episode. Um, so this being our first episode thomas i think we should give the viewers slash listeners whether you're listening to this on youtube or on various podcast providers we should give them sort of a a little bit of a history about our relationship and and fandom with these two shows sure sounds good to me so what's your uh how did you get into uh, the buffy and angel universe uh, I'm not sure exactly when it started because I was quite young when I first saw the show. Uh, I know my dad used to watch it, and that's probably how I got started. Um, yeah, as soon as it started being released on DVD and video, like I remember at one point, for, I think it was a Christmas present or something. I got bought season six and seven mm-hmm. on VHS, and <laughs> I've rewatched those seasons so many times. But uh, yeah, then later on, obviously, I bought all the DVDs. Right. Yeah, yeah VHS is, is going way back. And uh, and then, yeah, like you said, I've uh, I've uh, I've since got the, uh, the... I didn't have the VHS. I had the uh, uh, the DVDs straight away. I mean, when I when I bought the, the series. But um, for me, uh, I watched it as it was happening. I kind of am in a interesting situation because... As the the show was starting, I was entering high school, so so the perfect time for it, right? Much like the characters that I was watching, uh, I was in high school as well, and um, I I find it. See, sometimes when you're dealing with high school related shows, none of it feels like any of it's actually you know plausibly real, like, like the way the kids interact and uh, and like for instance, here, here's an example. Saved by the Bell is a perfect example. You know, they all had the same class. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was I never... both shows around the same time. So. Yeah, so like the, you know, they all had the same class. They were always, to, you know, together at all times. It, it was like, yeah, yeah, we're we're just hey, that's how high school is. You're always what Buffy did was you saw them separated at times, right? And, and you saw, I mean, obviously they'd congregate in the library and, and get together after classes, but. It was just the idea that it, it was sort of like throwing out the the Saved by the Bell trope, at least in when they actually when you actually saw them in classes where they were you know they were separate or like maybe two of them had the same class, but it wasn't like all five of them or however many of the Scooby Gang as they effecti- affectionately called themselves or were called um, were you know together in the same class. So I I mean it's a small detail, but it's one that I being in high school at the time appreciated because yeah okay that's that's somewhat it's realistic, realistic. Yeah. yeah in a show that is very um it's dealing with non-realistic situations vampires and monsters and such uh and slayers oh my i feel like i should be doing one of those um you know it's that aspect that was realistic so i appreciated it um but aside from being in high school um and it was funny because you know buffy had just moved to a different school a different and a different uh, area and I had been in the same situation I had just moved and and this was you know a new school uh, a new new people I was meeting so there were a lot there were a couple of similarities that, that I could sort of latch on to um, thankfully uh, I didn't encounter any uh, vampires at uh, at, uh, at my school but but you know those the, the real world uh, similarities were there which was cool as I was watching um, but in terms of the the, the you know the Buffy mythology. I had seen the um, the theatrical movie. Um, yeah, when, I, 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 when I saw, I think I made a couple of years after. So uh, yeah, 
Yeah, no, I had seen it. And it was okay, but it it was like like I watched it. It was fine. It was like oh, yeah, okay, that's that was that was all right. It was in, entertaining, uh, and I left it. And and the the tone was you know it was it was far too comedic for my liking. Movie where yeah there were there were jokes and you know one liners and, and and this and that and there was levity to it. But I think it goes more to what Joss Whedon's original intention for the project was. I mean, he was notoriously critical. Yeah. Because he even <laughs> he, he said wanted like, there to be a little bit more horror, and yeah. it's amazing that he got to do the more horror trope stuff on television. It's like usually yeah. you think allow for it, but. and you do see it uh, in the in the episodes, which we'll uh, which we'll uh, get to, you know, as we go along. You do see the horror elements. There are a couple of good um, actual jump scares uh, that that are in this epi- that are in the first two episodes, which is what we'll be covering today. Um, but yeah, so I was very, um, you know, in it from ground ground zero uh, in terms of watching the series. And uh, of course, once Angel started, I just I'm like, oh, good, another an, another an added element in this universe. Of course, I'm gonna watch it. Um, and I I really love both shows. I mean, Buffy had the adva- one distinct advantage of having Sarah Michelle Gellar. Um, uh, full <laughs> full disclosure. Um, you know, I had and still do have a big time crush on Sarah Michelle Gellar, so that will be that will be brought up several times on this show, and I have no shame in in doing so. Um, yeah. I could never decide between her and uh, Alison Hannigan. I, had I, I was, I was more I, I was more uh, her and and Cordelia, and then Faith came along, and it's like, all right, now there's three of them. Like, where do, where, what's what's going on here? Um, this Faith is great. was the so, first time I think I was ever attracted to the bad girl. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is true. Oh, so, Darla, I mean, well, Darla, yeah, yeah, I mean, except I'll when forever she forever have out, a crush on Julie Benz. <laughs> oh, well, Julie, yeah, I mean, there's basically a lot of these people in the Buffy verse. If if anybody follows my other podcast, they'll know about this mythical thing that I keep referencing. And people are probably sick of. I have a multiverse wives list, and and you know the full <laughs> list will be revealed uh, apparently in February because that's when uh, Stephen wants to have that episode. He thinks it'll be fun to do my multiverse wives list, my fictional multiverse wives list, obviously, uh, for a Valentine's Day episode. So that's what we're doing. Uh, but but needless to say, there are plenty um, Buffy alumni on that, uh, and Angel alumni on that list. So uh, I'm sure you'll all. Enjoy oh, listening. Just to when it comes saying out. Angel, you've just reminded me of Amy Yaka. Yes, yes, but there's no um, <laughs> another so, huge crush. It's amazing how many crushes I had just from those two shows. And plus, it's you know, it's, hey, I mean, the CW formula was alive and well back then. I mean, I don't think they cast average-looking people. No. <laughs> like it's a prerequisite. Sorry, if you look like you know an everyday normal human being, you're it's not you're not you're not. No, it's one of the funniest things about it. Is in a show with werewolves and vampires and ghosts and zombies, the most unrealistic part is that Alison Hannigan can't find it. Did yeah, that that is true. Um, and then she her have no trouble at all in my high school. And her eventual husband ends up uh, coming on the show later on, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, so <laughs> that is our that is my uh, you know both of our our sort of origin stories with the show. Um, but, but the reason I brought up that crush is because uh, what I wanted to say was that you know I was so in it on the ground floor that when I was in high school, you know the lockers, I had a couple pictures of Sarah Michelle Gellar in my take to my locker, um, and I would watch like if she was doing a movie, even if it was something that I didn't like, like if it was a genre that I normally didn't care about, I, I went and saw the movie. Like for example, I'm not. This is gonna sound weird because we're covering Buffy and Angel, but there are certain types of horror movies that I just don't watch. So like normally the scream stuff and the I know what you did last summer kind of stuff yeah. I wouldn't watch. But, but you did because she was in there. Then Sarah Michelle Gellar gets cast and I'm like, all right. And I knew she was probably gonna get killed in both, but it's like I'm going anyway. Uh, and then I can walk out if she like if she dies early in the movie, I'm out. I can just get up and leave. Uh, which is which is I, I will neither confirm nor deny doing that. But um, but yeah, so I mean that's there and it's gonna be mentioned off and on. Uh, so if you hear it, be forewarned. Uh, but um, the the Buffy verse extends to beyond uh, television because there are there are comic books that that there are two sets of comic books. There's one that continued the series. Um, you and know, there's uh, like some tie-in ones as well. But yeah, and there's tie-in ones with, that that sort of intersect between certain seasons. Uh, and then 
so there's there's intersecting ones, then there's um, follow up season. So I, I think it went from eight through eleven or twelve or whatever, and then there's a current um, relaunch of it. Which so basically, one comic studio was Dark Horse; they had the rights for years, and now Boom Studios has the rights. So that's why there's two sort of divergent. I've only read the first issue of the Boom ones, the sort of retelling of Buffy, but in the modern day. Yeah, I, mean, I liked uh, it. I just haven't had a chance to pick up. Like, yeah, issues. well, like I said, hopefully this podcast will, will 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 give us a chance to when 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 certain things pop up, we'll discuss them. Because, uh, uh, but but for now, until until that point, which I think I think the first set of tying comics comes at, yeah, at about season three of Buffy. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll bring those up again when when the need arises. Uh, but but those are out there definitely. That's another added layer to this universe that our fans can can you know check out and and will probably hear us speak about it at, at some point in the show. So there's you know just a, a note on that. But uh, let's get right into the uh, into the meat and potatoes of, of of the show, which is the first two episodes. Which really, I mean, they're two separate episodes, but it's really one piece. I mean, it's got the it sort of. There's a freeze frame and it says continued, but yeah. if you wanted to edit it together and just cut from that freeze frame to the first moment of next episode, it is so you can tell that it probably was in a feature premiere. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so get us started, uh, Tom. What did you? Uh... What did I think of the episode? Um, yeah, I mean, I love the way it starts. How you think? I mean, obviously, if you've seen the show before, you're not. It doesn't fool you anymore. But the first time seeing it, I do remember thinking. The guy was the vampire and Dala was going to be the victim. And it, it was yeah. a pretty cool twist to have her be the vampire. Like, that's a pretty fun way to open it. Um, yeah, I, I really like it. I, I I hate the principle from the first few episodes. Like, I can't wait until we finally reach. I think, it's, is it the pack where it's where he gets eaten? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. So you don't like that first. moment in the episode, yeah. When, yeah. when he's like going on about Buffy burning down the gym, which is interesting considering that actually didn't happen in the movie. But because I saw this show first, like my memory of the movie is that it does end with the gym burning down, even though it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's stuff that happens in a gym, but it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't burn down by the end. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the cast is great. I, I think I can't remember if Xander skateboards ever again. It, maybe that was and after that it. event, probably not. I mean, he runs right into the railing. Yeah, uh, you know, because he's his looking first at Buffy. Day trying to learn. <laughs> I mean, well, to be fair, he's he's admiring Buffy, so I mean, yeah. who he's the hell? He's also shouting this? like, "Out the way! I don't know how to stop." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, but it, it was pretty. It was a pretty funny moment. Um, no, I agree with you on the principle. I think he's he, he's terrible. Yeah. Uh, Not even and, just uh, the character. I, I don't particularly like his. He's sort of playing it more as a comedy show. Yeah, he probably probably when he he was introduced to the project probably thought. Oh, if it's like the movie, it's going to be a comedy, right? Or there's going to be a lot of comedy elements in it. And that's what he played, even though that, that probably wasn't the case. Uh, but I'd venture to guess that they probably knew that he wasn't meant to last long in this universe. So they're just like, yeah, do what you apparently want. You won't be here. supposed to last longer, but apparently Joss Whedon, like, oh, okay. he was killed off. Oh, well, and then they like, brought in Corp from Deep Space Nine. So. Yeah. I love a bit of a... Yeah, so anytime you can throw in some Star Trek uh, alumni, it's, it's a good time. Um, he was doing that and Deep Space Yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy, yeah. Um, but, and to, just to what you said, um, the the twist where Darla ends up being the vampire um, is very much in keeping with, you know, the whole thing of that, that Joss Whedon was... was, was going for with which is the female empowerment and, and that goes both ways in, in the good sense and on the evil side of the equation right i mean usually in horror movies or or shows the the, the woman is the victim right and mm. I mean, that was his main the movie wasn't it? it was like you expect the blonde cheerleader to be one of the victims and then when she turns around and starts kicking vampire ass like it, it, it's great it's, it's such a great reversal of what is commonly a horror trope and yeah yeah, yeah. it's um, a great concept and it's i like that for i mean it goes at least about 15 to 20 minutes i would say before they they reference like before somebody else brings up i mean buffy almost says vampires a couple times but before anybody actually references her being the slayer it's not until 
like she meets Giles with words. Yeah, say. We, which is a great. I, I think that meeting is a is a great uh, back and forth between Sarah Michelle Gellar and Anthony Stewart Head, uh, in the sense that they, like as soon as she comes in, Giles is excitedly, you know, he's like, I've been expecting you. Got like, that giant book on the yeah, desk. Yeah, he's, he's, he's like, let's get right down to business. And you could see in in, in that interaction, you could see the the burden that that Buffy's been carrying. Yeah, I mean, she just wants to have a normal first day of sleep. Yeah, and then she has a lot of a lot of stuff that she's probably worried about in that moment, and she just didn't consider vampires to be one of them. She's like, yeah, that'll come, that might come, but it'll be late. Like it won't be on the first day. Like, I, um, but. You know, just the, like, but just in the performance, you feel the weight of the situation once she realizes, like, even here, like, not even, not, not here too. Like, you know, I just wanted to go through one day without without any of this stuff, you know, cropping up. Um, and, and it really, you know, it effectively puts you in 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 her mindset and gives you that that frame of reference. So I, I like that interaction, and I think. There's no he uh, Anthony Stewart Head is just perfect for this kind of role. Like he just like it fits him like a glove. Um, I have noticed when re- rewatching it though that he hasn't quite got the accent posh British accent down yet because yeah. his accent is actually in real life is a bit more close to uh, to what Spikes would end up being. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like he was basically yeah when James Masters eventually comes in like he was basically copying Anthony Head's. Yeah, real actor. his voice is very slightly different. Especially, I particularly noticed it in the uh, the scene in the bronze, sort of teaching Buffy to recognize a vampire from. The- right. Yeah, when he's trying it's to have quite that. Quite interesting seeing that. Yeah. Um. But 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 still, he's he's great he's in that mentor mentor role, which then becomes kind of like it morphs into like a father figure role. Uh, as the you know as the, the years progress, and you know it's the classic. She's the he's the Alfred to her Batman, if you will, right? Um, yeah. Kind of thing. Um, and li- I like that even he acknowledges that like there's the scene where eventually you know Willow and the gang are brought in on the on the secret, and he's trying to find the the, the city plans like to, to track down the vampires, mm-hmm. and he's giving her all this this jargon about not being able to figure out what's on the computer because he wants her to help her out, him out with the computer, and he's like. Oh, that was a bit a bit British, wasn't it? I want you to search that. And he's like, I want you to search the net. And, and it was like, I think he calls it the web. Yeah, <laughs> the, the back web. When the internet yeah. was still called the World Wide Web. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, it's ninety-seven. Um, but yeah, so I, I I definitely from the start, Giles was I thought was a was a great character. Um, what did you What did you think of the way the rest of the gang was brought in and? Um, I their like, re- their reaction to the whole scenario. I like it. I mean, Xander sort of found out by accident. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was quite. I, I love his line when because Buffy had dropped her stake and he gives it back to her and says, "Okay, the only thing I can think is that you're building a really little fence." Yeah, <laughs> I just love that line. Um, yeah, he overhears. I, I can't remember if it's even though I watched the episode today because I've seen the unaired pilot quite a few times. Yeah. He overhears in the library as well, Giles talking to Buffy. Yes, he? yes, yeah. that's, that's the that's, one. That's, that's in both versions. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously Willow finds out a vampire tries to take her to the master. And yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting way of doing it. And I like that Willow immediately you see what her role in the in the Scooby gang is going to be like mm-hmm. she she's the hacker she, she's the computer whiz because Giles is useless with technology yeah he's um, inept with it yeah. and yet and Xander as well though it's it's a theme that's going to carry on all almost through all seven seasons where yeah. he it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what his role in the group is and uh yeah it's, it's an interesting journey like it's, it's kind of amazing that it took seven seasons to get there, but then once he does realise, like obviously I'm getting way ahead of us now, but like when he finally realises sort of what his role in the group is, mm. it's almost too late. He's quite a tragic character. Yeah, he definitely is. Um, <clears throat> and it, but it was it was sort of I found in this episode he was trying to, or the position they put him in was to sort of play up the traditional or try to achieve the traditional roles that that a man would have in this kind of a show and it's Whereas, cool that he's really trying hard to do that but it doesn't really work even yeah. though he does stake a couple of vampires like there it's accidental <laughs> yeah um and um 
but yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the way each character got introduced to it, and I like sort of, there was a, especially from Willow's point of view, there was kind of like, there were moments, you know, after Buffy saved both her and Xander from, from the, the first time they were attacked, um, there was the shock, the shock moment of it all, where, the, where, where she had to process it, and she like, thought she was going to faint, and all that stuff. And then, yeah, just <laughs> they just keep saying, just breathe, Willow. Yeah, and then, but then there's also that acceptance because there's no denying it because you saw it. They're like, there's no, there's no way to deny that now, right? So it's and just. I, like, I love that Buffy literally lists off a couple of alternate theories, theories for what it could be. Like, oh, that guy turning to dust, just a trick of the light. Yeah, <laughs> she's like, I thought about all that. I thought all that too. The first time that I that I that I saw one, um, and then <laughs> there's play, they're playing up the uh, another trope where where Buffy's talking about how they got away, and Xander says something, oh, they can fly, and she's like, no, <laughs> they can drive. And that was kind of funny because it's playing up on the classic, you know, conception of Dracula that he could fly. Um, also, they could fly in the movie. <laughs> that's right too. Yeah, um, but. I'm guessing they just don't didn't have the budget to make them fly on TV, so they. I, I'd venture not. Back in '97, especially, yeah. <clears throat> um, but I one of the things I did like, I love it for whatever reason, and it's the simplest. You know, it may seem like the simplest thing, but I love that library set. It's so cool. It's a shame uh, that the actors grew to hate it because it meant that they had a long day of just a lot of exposition. So they they grew to hate it, but it's it's such a great set yeah. for the show like it's right easily one yeah. of my favorite locations and it's I, like i loved it so much that i paid homage to it or i had an artist pay homage to it in a comic book that i wrote um and so the layout is very similar to to the library in in the show so that's how much i i love that that locale um it's almost but, a shame that when the high school gets rebuilt and they didn't make a new library because it would have been pretty cool to have that right yeah yeah it would have been. It would have been uh, had they rebuilt it or, or a different version of it. But um, and I guess then they had no reason. They had yeah, no well, I mean, the show was ending, so what, what's the what would be the point, right? I mean, yeah. Plus, uh, who would be using it? Like all the Scooby Gang are adults at this point. They just have. But, all, but, but then again, yeah. then again, the way it ended, or with that speech that Buffy. Could, I mean, we're way ahead of ourselves now. But but you could theoretically that could be like the hub of 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 the Slayer. It could be the Slayer's Batcave per per, per se. <laughs> Uh, if if they wanted to play it that way, um, but so we talked about how the you know the Scooby Gang kind of figures out the secret and how they're, they 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 interact with um, with that knowledge. Um, but what did you think of of before we get to some of like the the jump scares in the action? Um, what did you think of the fact that as soon as this show starts, like the first couple episodes, the first two episodes here, we're talking about this here's how i'm going to refer to it it's like third act this movie third act kind of level event like the harvest where you know the master is gonna gonna rise and cause you know hell on earth like it, like it's not it's not starting with let, let, let's have her stop you know the the, the sort of like the e, basically like a video game you'd have like the easy boss level and then you know yeah. <laughs> right Here, I, I like, like it I, yeah that's right, it's right away to start yeah like like it right. throws you right into the into the mythology and the idea that the Hellmouth right is part of the name of the show is literally underneath the high school yeah uh, which is fantastic I mean yeah it, it, it's a great way to sort of throw it at the deep end like Buffy it, it's good because Buffy's sort of reluctant to accept her destiny at that point and the fact that tonight the end of the world may happen unless you just do your job Buffy it's just yeah, brilliant way to start it, and it's just you, you. It sets the tone immediately, and the master is such a cool villain, and mm. yeah, it's just great to start it off. I, I'm, I'd much prefer they start it off like with a big apocalyptic scenario than just monster of the week. Like if they started with teacher's pet instead, like it, it wouldn't have worked yeah. quite as well. Oh, definitely not. I think, I think you want to start big, mm. uh, and, and also more... it sets up the season finale, like the end of the season. Is like obviously the showdown with the master, and it's like it sets up the whole uh, overarching story. Right, and it's yeah. it's great because obviously you know the master's not going to escape in episode two. Yeah, <laughs> but well, definitely. But it still fact, establishes what an extreme threat he is, and that's right. Fantastic. And the fact that he got that close in episode two, 
Mm. It shows you the, 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 the level of the threat that I think is important. And also, his underlings, specifically Luke, I think the character was, yeah, was pretty formidable in his own right. Um, yeah, I, I, lo- I love that character. And it's so cool that they brought the actor back a little bit later on. Like, yeah. I've got a little book that came with my Deep Season 1 DVD. I'm just going to see who does he play later on. Oh, yeah, in um, Brian Thompson, the actor, he's in Surprise and Innocence. He plays the judge later on, which is another pretty cool character. Yeah, because you, cause you are, with, with him, all you see is is vampire face. Like, like Yeah. Basically. And all they have to do is change the makeup slightly, and you can just, even though it, it's, it's recognizable because he's yeah. just got such a recognizable presence. Yeah. Uh, but he's fantastic. Like it's, it's a shame almost. I wonder if the reason they brought him back as the judge is because they kind of regretted killing him off in episode two because he was such a great sort of villain. Right. Like, yeah. 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 You, if they hadn't killed him off, I could easily see him surviving through. I mean, who knows if he'd stayed around, maybe he would have taken the, the role of spike or something like, yeah. Yeah. He could have easily, uh, I think, handled not so much for the there. romantic stuff later, but he definitely would. No, no, but for the villain, yeah, I can't see him getting, yeah, I can't see him being the the romantic type, but but the villainous type is definitely like he could have been, he could have been a big bad on uh, on the show for sure. Um, like he and, could have like got away at the end of season one when the masters killed and come back like season two finale or something as the big yeah. bad. Like totally could have pulled it off. No, what but, did I mean, you that's one of the things they killed Darla off too soon as well later oh, on. Oh, Darla could have lasted. Yeah, yeah, she was. Apart from my my enjoyment of Julie Benz, you know. But they they bring her back in flashbacks and then in Angel. Yeah, and yeah. Like we're getting right ahead of ourselves now. Yeah, let's yeah let's not go through the they, whole. <laughs> it was an ongoing theme with season one though that they killed off characters that I think they regretted immediately. <laughs> yeah, they. They unfortunately made the same mistakes that the early Batman movies did, killing off the villains. Um, but um, the staying on the villains for a second, what did you think? Uh, like you said, I, I think the Master is one of the greatest. Uh, I mean, that's an awesome villain. Uh, like we've already established how threatening he is, even though he's not really perpetrating, you know, all the all the villainy in this. Like he's he's the the, the puppeteer, and, and he's not even that power in this. Like in like the first few episodes of season one, he's not even physically particularly powerful. Like he's, he's almost kind of like a weakling, but you can yeah. tell that he, the, the vampires that work for him, like have such reverence for him. And like when he kills that one guy, like he gets one vampire to apologize for failing him. And then he just killed, he like just pokes his eye out. Yeah. Like it's pretty, you just see just, this is one bad dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. And the way they use that, like, the way they strike that balance, and you know, this is partly to do with the way Joss Whedon writes it, but also the way the actor portrays it. But the way they balance the physically imposing, scary nature of the character, what, like when he's saying "you failed me," and you think, "Okay, he's just gonna snap his neck or something," or like right away. But then he's like, you know, apologize, and, and like there's that moment where he, you know, where he gets nice about it. Mm. He's like, "You've got something in your eye," yeah. <laughs> and, and he, like you falsely when he asks him to apologize, the way he's talking, you're like. Oh, maybe he's gonna let him live. Like if you hadn't watched the series before, like maybe he's gonna let him live, you know, and get another chance. Oh no, it's just and then and then like you said, he's just toying with him. Yeah, and he's like, you've got something in your eye. It was pretty. It was it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, but you're right. How how menacing and threatening he was was impressive, given how weak he was portrayed in this first uh, in this first two episodes. But also too, what's important is the balance of you know having. The vampires look like the most beautiful people on earth, but then also when they change, having them look quite scary and menacing. I, I think the the balance is, is struck really well. Mm. Um, and it's cool that the master's makeup isn't just another regular vampire. Like you can tell that he's such an old vampire that whereas other vampires can pass for human, like the master has no chance because even his ears and stuff are different. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. He, it's a great look. It's a, a scary looking villain. I, I, I loved it. Um, the only thing that makes me laugh though is knowing that on the set they used to make fun of him. They used to say that he had Kool Aid mouth because his his mouth was so sort of pink. They used no, to make yeah, fun yeah, of him for that. Yeah, that's hilarious. It, um, it's one of those things I didn't notice. I didn't really pick up on watching the show, but after you, you hear that sort of anecdote from the set. 
you can't not see it. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. Once you hear it, it, it changes your perception of it. It still um, looks very, very menacing, though. Oh yeah, it so still it works. Really like, watching it twenty some odd years later. Um, now, one of the things we've got to touch on is the introduction of Angel. Yes, I can't believe we haven't mentioned Angel so far. Yeah. But at the time, uh, did you know? Did you pick up on the fact that he was a vampire? Because I, I do remember my mother saying, "I think he's a vampire," and my well, dad was adamant, like, "No, I think he's just an angel." <laughs> at first, at first, I thought because you you didn't know who was following her um, her around, right? And, and when he was following her around, and then it was revealed to be him, I'm like, "Hmm, you know, whoever's following her around, you, you thought immediately was a vampire." But then when she takes him down and she does so, you know, pretty effectively and pretty easily, I was like, eh. And then he's like, I, don't worry, I don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> and when he said that, I'm like, all right, I, I guess with it. And when he said, I'm a friend, but then he said, I'm not of yours, I, like Buffy, thought he must know Giles. Like, th- yes. that's, that's what he's referring to. Um, like, maybe he was one of the watchers or, or something like that. Uh, but... So I was kind of mixed was in the sense of was he going to be a vampire? Was he not? Like I, I wasn't, I was 50, 50 on the, on the subject. Um, but you know, obviously as we know, uh, he was, but I, mean, I do remember my dad taking it at face value, like just adamant that no, I think he's actually an angel. Like if there's demons, there's probably angels too. Uh, and that's a good, you know what? And your father had, had a good, uh, a good, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a fair thing to believe because, if there are demons, you're right. But then it's not surprising when he does turn out to be a vampire, because you're like... Right, right. It could, like I said, I love the fact that after these first two episodes, you, you like, you didn't have a... At least I'm speaking from my perspective. I didn't have a guaranteed opinion one way or the other. I, I was literally split. Of one minute I thought, oh, yeah, he is. And then another minute, oh, no, he's definitely not. So, so like, it fluctuated until they actually, you know, gave us more evidence that, okay, yeah. But again extenuating circumstances that we will delve into once we get there. But I think part of the fact that it had us or it had me questioning um, and your dad and, and, and such, mm. and then it had your mom on the whole total opposite end of the spectrum. Yes. She knew pretty much immediately that he was probably a vampire. That's a good testament to the writing and David Boreanaz's, you know, portrayal in this first mm. episode, like the okay. mystery with which it leaves you. Right. Uh, Cause you're, just not sure, and so that that, that credit's going to be given to writing and, and performance in that instance. Um, uh, what did you think of? Uh, let me put it to you this way: the jump scares. Uh, yeah, there there were a couple. Um, I'm not a huge fan of jump scares in general. Mm-hmm. I think it's almost almost, especially with a lot of modern horror movies, jump scares are quite a lazy way mm-hmm. to make the audience. Well, to make them jump. Yeah. But I think it's quite a lazy method for horror. I much prefer when it's all about the tone and the atmosphere yeah. and just oncoming. Just, yeah, psychological. Like just a feeling. I, I would take a feeling of dread over a jump scare any right. day. But, but it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a trope of the genre and they don't overdo it. Like it's my thing is it's, it's depending on the it's dependent on the execution. Mm. So like. The, the first one where it happens where uh, the the guy that Darla killed... Yeah, when she turns around, she's got falls face. No, no, well, that that was a good one because... That's not so much a jump scare, though. No, but it, it, Are you talking about when he fell I'm, out of I'm the locker? I'm talking about when he falls out of the locker. Yeah. Because that, that's, when, a, that's a decent one. And it, that's done to a good effect because it's it's not just bad guy jumps out from behind a... Yeah. From behind a wall uh, or something. So ca- like. the, way, the way it's done is it, is, is it was kind of casual. And it wasn't telegraphed. My problem is when you can telegraph them. Yeah. And like, you know, I you, mean, the fact that it happened in a comedic scene. Yeah. There's it's just sort of Cordelia and her friend. Oh, yeah. I, I think Cordelia is, is she? She's there, isn't she? And like, it's just a yeah. comedic scene where they're talking about what well, was it in this version of it? Or was it just in the unaired pilot where it's like, what kind of a name is Buffy? It was in, yeah, it was in here. Yeah, it was in here. Yeah. 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 It's, it's funny. I can, because they're both so similar, but they've got differences. I can never remember. <laughs> Even if I watched it that day, I can never remember which one certain bits come from and all of that. But, yeah, they were very similar. Yeah. But yeah, very very yeah. similar scene. Like it, it's it's a a comedic scene. You think it's just going to be a comedic scene, and then suddenly there's a dead body, and it's just yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's a pretty works. well done thing. That's why it works because it, it you can't telegraph it. My problem is when you can telegraph and you know it's coming. Mm. 
that's when it becomes okay. I mean, it's the trope of they're walking in a dark basement and suddenly yeah, yeah, get a cat up, yeah, jumps out of yeah, nowhere yeah, and screams. Yeah, exactly, out. exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, but oh, by the way, we haven't mentioned Cordelia uh, because yeah, that's an absolute from this is jumping ahead, but from when you first meet her here to where she ends up, it's a, it's w- what character growth that is. I, mean, uh, I, I I pretty much hated Delia at the Oh, me too. Uh, she became one of my favorite characters on Angel, so oh, absolutely. it's amazing how much she changes. Yeah, the, uh, the character growth is great. And you know what the cool thing is? I think every high school had a girl that, that was like that. You know, the hottest girl in school, but, okay. it had, but her attitude was in the toilet. Mm. Yeah, every every school has that. Yeah, yeah, just so the, pop, the popular kids. Yeah. She's just like the ultimate popular kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's basically yeah. got her own minions that follow yeah, her around but, and think she's but, great. But I remember at the beginning, I hated her character. Like, it was just absolutely... Um... Because it's probably because I hated people that were like that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 100% agreed. And you know, it was a funny scene that I think kind of was unique to watch play out, was that, you, so they build up, you know, Buffy as the Slayer. And then as they're preparing for the third, the, the third act battle of, of you know, the episode, like, quote-unquote episode two... She's like, I gotta make a stop to get some supplies, right? Mm. And so she goes, and, and her mother grounds her. So we've gotten this buildup of, oh my god, this badass this Slayer, but she starts to contend with being She's grounded. grounded. Yeah, yeah. I, like I thought that was hilarious. As I know, you don't get everything. Yeah, but no, yeah. She can't just say Slayer. Yeah, she'll, <laughs> she'll end up in an uh, asylum. But no, but it was fun. You know, the juxtaposition of here's this badass, you know, almost superheroic Slayer, but you know. She, she you, you're reminded that she's only human and she has to deal with you know being grounded and and, and obeying her her mother and, and, her, and you know the the authority figures in her life it, it's very much a spider-man uh, kind of trope right yeah, definitely. which she's is she's got the real world like the real world and just sort of the outside of the supernatural stuff is yeah. a constant foil. Like she's she's as much like a superhero as she is, she's still got to deal with real world stuff and she does right. get in trouble if she doesn't go to class, even though she's not going to class because she's gonna gotta save the world. But like it's it's yeah, very it makes it very relatable. And 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 like Giles was 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 saying, you you know, you, he says to her, You don't know the full extent of your powers. And you kinda see you can kinda see that she is sort of um a little bit not to a, a, a full-on superhero degree, but she is extra special in the sense that I mean, when she jumps over that fence, yeah, no, no, no normal person, I don't think. No, definitely, and would be able to. We know how fence. she's yeah. very, very strong. Like when she first meets Angel, when she's like doing a handstand on top of that pipe. Yeah. Like, oh, that's it's, cool. It's the way awesome. it was, lit, the way it was lit, and everything. That was a great scene. I, I loved it. Totally. Um, just fantastic and even later in episode two like xander's i think when xander saves willow he's just like don't worry buffy's a superhero <laughs> yeah and it's kind of it's it's almost literal uh, in sense. but yeah, yeah she, uh, she's and, got superpowers and she's yeah, a hero she's yeah. literally a superhero because they talk about a costume. right they talk about um you know when you were, you mentioned it earlier about giles telling her about her her ability to you know spot or sense a vampire spot a vampire it's essentially spidey sense but you know, Slayer sense, I guess, if you want to call it. It is funny that the way that she does it is obviously he expects it to be like a almost like a spidey sense, but the way she does it in this in episode one is she's just like, look at what he look what the guy's wearing. Like yeah. vampires always think that fashion died when they did. Yeah, with the collar and everything, that was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so, but it is uh, really her using her instincts. Like she's just yeah. using them in a way that relates closer to her. Yeah, true. Yeah, so. Let's talk about your favorite action or set piece that uh, you that you. Uh, probably, I like I. I've got to say, my favorite action set piece is sort of the finale bit where they're in the bronze and loads of people are dying, and I, I just love the way that Buffy stops uh, the guy. Oh damn, I've forgotten his name now. Luke. Luke, yeah, the way she stops him by saying, there's one thing you haven't thought about, sunrise, and she breaks the window and he starts freaking out, and she's like, it's in about nine hours, moron. <laughs> yeah, because, and the cool thing, the fun thing about that is, like, we're seeing her kick his butt, Yeah. but then she also uses smarts to beat him. Yeah. So it's a mix of brains and brawn that she uses to, 
Which he's Miley. using his own idiocy against him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's he's powerful, but clearly he's just yeah, incredibly dumb. That that was a great scene. That that, 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 that scene in the Bronx. It was good. Uh, I liked it. It kind of. I mean, it's totally not the same, but the threat of all those vampires in the club kind of echoes, you know, what Blade would do a year later in, mm-hmm. in, in, in its opening club scene. I mean, all that was missing was the was the uh, the the. the um, the blood pouring from the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, uh, but but it, it gave off similar vibes uh, for sure. Um, I really liked the fight with uh, uh, with Luke in the um, in the mausoleum. In the mausoleum, uh, because you know both char- both characters look effective. I mean, yeah. Buffy gets beaten, but she puts up one hell of a fight. Oh, definitely. Right. So there's the balance of making our hero look heroic, but our villain look threatening. And I think they found that balance uh, <clears throat> perfectly, almost. So, and there was a little bit of a jump scare there, but it yeah. was a bit more. You was expecting it a little bit more. It's like when she gets pushed into the like the coffin thing. Yeah, and but like, again, not overdone. Luke not jumps overdone. up and he yeah. jumps in, and it's like right before the to be continued. Bit of yeah. a jump scare because for a minute you think, oh, maybe he's just left. He's gone now. He's just left her in yeah. there. Right, right, but it wasn't overdone. <laughs> uh, Great way to done. end, sort of. Yeah, yeah the part half, one. Half and and I I liked um, just the way the the the, the, the you know the, the quote unquote second episode ends off. It ends on you know they've they've saved the day. There's a, a positive note, right? Mm. It, it's happening in the daylight with with, with you know in sunlight, and you know they're 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 talking about you know they're poking fun at Buffy's past expulsion, and she's like, well, let's figure out ways you could get suspended, <laughs> and they're they're running through the gamut and. Jaws, because as this conversation is going on, Jaws is like, don't you know, more is coming. We have to be ready. And then as they're as they're walking up, it's like the world is doomed. And that's and, and that's how it ends. I, I I that was a good chuckle. So I love the way they ended on a positive, playful note. Yeah. Uh, Even the fact that I mean, they say at one point like, what's going to happen tomorrow? Like, there's one thing for sure, nothing's ever going to be the same. And then they go to school, and everything's the same. Like, yeah. people have just kind of ignored. The fact that they saw vampires, yeah, and just like yeah, pe- people have to make excuses in their heads just yeah. to stop them going mad, essentially. Yeah, right, and that's that's true with with sort of anything we're not comfortable with or, or don't or can't. Mm. People do me. have a way of sort of making excuses for things they don't quite want to accept, and yeah. it was a very cool sort of poignant moment, and it also explains why from episode two onwards everybody in school. <laughs> doesn't know about the vampires because it would be a very different <sighs> show if they did. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Although by by graduation, they they pretty much come. Everybody knows. <laughs> they've all come to accept it. And yeah, it's, it's, I can't wait till we get to that episode. That's basically, you're 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 attending your educational studies on top of Elmoth. Just just yeah. <laughs> accept it and, and and roll with it uh, at some point. But um, yeah, so overall. Is there anything else you want to mention that we haven't covered, or do you think we've done a, a decent job of covering? I think we've done a decent job. I can't think of anything right this second. Uh, oh, I do like the moment where Buffy killed one vampire with a pool cue. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, and she just left it there, and there was like a little pause. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah, brilliantly well done. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I like it. I like it a lot. When she... When she, uh, when she saves Cordelia, right, when Luke was about to bite her, and then uh, she she jumps down and lands on the pool table and does the, you know, as Deadpool calls it, the superhero landing. Yeah. That, that was kind of... And she somehow doesn't break her knees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, at some point, you gotta... The suspension of disbelief is how she doesn't break her knees, but yeah, in a show about bad vampires, the suspension of disbelief is, is that. Uh, but it was, it was still a, a, a cool moment to, to watch uh, play out. Definitely. Uh, I have just, because uh, my season one DVD came with like an episode guide, little booklet. I have just looked at it and uh, apparently he, when Joss Whedon wrote the script for the show, he based it on his original version of the Buffy movie script. Right, apparently yeah. in his original version, the gym did end up getting burnt down at the end. Okay, so that's why. So yeah, that, that's why he's doing that. He's like, just yeah. The obviously the directors decided not to do that. Maybe they didn't have the budget to burn down the, a gym, right. and that's why they didn't do it. But that that's why she burnt burnt down a gym. Yeah. All right. So the, the, 
there's it kind the, of explains it a little there's bit. There's the explanation of the continuity divergence. There we go. Yeah. It wasn't like a hindsight thing where he's like, oh, I wish I'd done that. It's like, no, that was in the script and the director cut it out. I and think there's one of the, one of the, now that you mentioned, one of the Dark Horse comics. Yeah, they adapted the first movie as a new. Is a direct um, adaptation of his script. So I got to see if I can track that down. I, I read that years and years ago. Like the only thing that annoyed me about it is that the vampires in it look nothing like the vampires from the show. Like, yeah. I think if they were going to readapt the original script, they should have tried to right. tie to it to the, it show. the show. Yeah, mm. uh, but I, I'm going to see if I can track that down. But since we've covered everything, it's that time of the episode where before we get out of here, we have to give it a rating. So, with that being said, we're going to rate both episodes as one because we've been. Reviewing it as one big, uh, um, yeah, one big um, event. So that's how we're going to proceed. So, how would you rate this two-part? I'd give it a solid eight point five out of ten. Yeah, yeah. good choice, good choice. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go along with you and say eight point five. It was overall really solid. Um, Great way to start. It's just uh, yeah. there are better episodes coming later on, so I can't give it a ten. <laughs> it, it just it just hooks you right in though, and, and it, oh, definitely it definitely leaves you wanting more. And it did it did back in 1997 when I first watched it, and it did again yesterday when episode two finished. I mean, if I didn't if I didn't know that I would have to rewatch this when the next episode comes around, I would have probably burned through at least half of the first season uh yesterday but uh, <laughs> i i should i'm gonna so save it i'm gonna watch i'm yeah. gonna re-watch it along for yeah. the podcast like. yeah I, I i showed some restraint which is not usually my forte so <laughs> i'm gonna pat myself on the back as soon as this episode wraps um but it's an 8.5 out of 10 for both of us um and we we, we can't recommend it highly enough if you haven't seen this show yet and you've stumbled onto this podcast uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen spo- the show yet, what the hell are you doing listening to this podcast? We, we kind of spoiled <laughs> it for you a bit, but we still Spoiled everything. To check it out. And uh, if you watch the series and love the series, then we recommend you follow along with us and do a rewatch because uh, it's been a while since I've done a rewatch, and this has been well, just the first two episodes have been. Uh, and if enjoyable. we do two episodes at a time, like we when once Angel starts, we might as well do like one episode of Buffy, one episode yeah, of Angel, watch it my, as if we would have done. Yeah, that was my plan. That was my plan. So we're Fantastic. on the same. We're on the same page. Uh, <laughs> but in between now and our next episode, Tom, yeah. if our listeners want to get in touch with you and talk more Buffy, where can they do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter at um, at t gallagher seven. Um, yeah, reach out to me on Twitter. Awesome. And uh, also, I do a podcast about uh, the Adventures of Superboy television mm-hmm. series. So if you want to listen, if you ever saw that. Go check out Superboy Legacy. Another and, great show, uh, yeah. Uh, good you can always that. contact me through that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, check that show out because, you know, Sam G. Rizzo, a uh, good friend of mine, is also the... Yeah, and you're on, you're on that show as well. You yeah, know, I, I, first I, episode I, and, I fly and over every once in a while uh, to, 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 <laughs> to borrow a, a Superman trope. I, I, you know, I, you I, I fly <laughs> in and do a superhero landing every once in a while uh, over there. Uh but yeah, definitely check it out because uh, Sam's great and Tom, they, they, both of them are great together, uh, taking you through uh, the Superboy series. Uh, and Tom's uh, doing, uh, he's pitching his own season. Uh, yeah, we uh, recorded pitch. an episode yesterday, in fact, uh, yeah. episode two. Yeah. And it's funny, earlier on you said that uh, Giles is Alfred to Buffy's Batman. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because in season five, episode two, I've cast Giles as Alfred. Well, that's, that's <laughs> great. I, I, and I, I endorse that casting. Um, so there you go. That's a great, good, good casting choice. Um, but yeah, so follow Tom and, and interact with Tom uh, on Twitter. And if you want to follow me, it's at Adam underscore least fan on Twitter. And then we also have the Multiverse Musings podcast network Facebook page. Uh, go there, uh, request a minute into the group. And either myself or one of my other co-hosts uh, on the network will add you, and we can continue talking about everyone's favorite vampire slayer um, there. I and, also uh, want to give a quick shout out um, to the guy that made the theme tune for this podcast. Yes, definitely. Uh, I was going to get to that. Yeah, so give yeah. him uh, Shmuel Pernicone. I'm hoping I pronounced your name right. I really should have asked. Definitely. Uh, but yeah, 
uh, there's obviously in the, there's going to be a link in the description. Go check out his YouTube yeah. channel. But he did that awesome Buffy Angel theme tune mashup yeah. on his guitar, and it's it's just fantastic. So uh, go it's check great. him out. It's great, and it's unique enough that hopefully uh, nobody will sue us. <laughs> we, I mean, we've got his permission to use it, obviously. Yeah, uh, but hopefully just the, not the permission the, of the people that originally composed the theme tunes. <laughs> the powers that be. Yeah, I mean, they, it should uh, be fine. When yeah, I hold the powers that be, yeah. yeah. We're not making money off of this, so just take that into account. We're, this is basically free advertisement for your show or your shows uh, and your comic book products. So there we go. <laughs> it's all, all, all in good fun. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so thanks for the theme. It's great, and uh, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate you letting us uh, us uh, use it and highlight your your work. Um, but until next episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this uh, first journey uh, of podcasting through the Hellmouth um, that is the Buffy and Angel universe. Uh, and we want to remind you that Buffy the Vampire Slayer is forever, from the first time she slays a vampire to the last. So long, everybody. Let's just hope that they, that reboot actually happens that they announced three years ago. <laughs> I hope so. Until then. Goodbye, guys. Peace.